Hi guys, and welcome to Gilcrest and Hamilton's GCSE English Literature Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about William Blake's 1794 poem, London, from Songs of Innocence and Experience. And first we will talk about the structure of the poem, um, and then the poetic features language and some useful contextual information that you may need to know about the poem. So, um, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Paul Hamilton, will now read you the poem. Over to you, Paul. Okay. Hello. Um, so, this is London by William Blake. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh, runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear, how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. Awesome. So, um, I think that this is a, as, as with all of Blake's poetry, especially his songs of innocence and experience, yeah. Um, there's this kind of superficial simplicity yeah. um, to the poem, which takes the form essentially of a song, right? It's in um, quatrains that rhyme A, B, A, B. Mm -hmm. um, Iambic tetrameter. Exactly, iambic tetrameter. And um, so this seems like a song and a lot of William Blake's poetry, especially the songs of innocence has been, um, put to music as has, of course, his famous poem, Jerusalem. Um, mm. but underneath this kind of simple lyricism, lyricism is the quality of something, um, being like a song and underneath this simple lyricism lies really a conceptually very, very dense and complicated um, piece of work. Yes. Um, so um, I think in terms of the language then, uh, what, what did you make of the language in this and, and its use of poetic features? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, uh, the language. I mean, I think that um, the first thing that strikes me is the use of oxymorons and the i think that the oxymoron is a good place to start off because it is it, you know a, a what what is it's a foolish contradiction of yeah so it means it, it means pointedly foolish pointedly in, foolish from That's from right. greek so oxy means pointy in greek right. and um, moria obviously means a uh, folly or foolishness. So, um, it, as in, it's where we get the word moron from in right, modern right, English. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, right. yeah, yeah. So could you give yeah. an example of an oxymoron in this poem? Then? Well, so it, this, this poem has a number of oxymorons or, or oxymoron like form formulations. And I think that, um, because the, the theme of this poem is, that there's something profoundly wrong with London. It's it's corrupt. It's rotten at its core. The oxymoron is an appropriate literary device because it suggests two things yoked together that should not be together. So, um, for example, the chartered Thames. The idea that you would be able to charter an entire river, you know, is is, is sort of ludicrous. Um, on its face. So he wanders through each chartered streets. I wander through each chartered streets near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. So charter is um, a written grant by a country's sovereign power that funds an institution. Um, it is permission 
and um and, and and you know the idea that you'd have you 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 could um charter an entire river is is sort of on its face ludicrous um the chartered thames um also um and we we can talk about this more um you know you have a number of different jarring uh contrasts and contradictions i mean, of course the most a uh, forceful one is in that final line, the marriage hearse. Um, mm-hmm. That's an example of an oxymoron. That's, that's a very good example of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because it right. yokes together two things that we would never associate normally, um, marriage and a hearse, the vehicle in which a dead body is is carried. Um, and of course, it, it also is suggestive of, of Blake's own personal views about the nature of most marriages. Um but if we get back to the first stanza, I think that yeah, it's a very yeah. good point that this this charter refers to um, ownership um, and specifically, I think, the guilds charters in, mm. in London in the period. So these are the charters that specific makers of specific things such as paper makers or copper workers were given to sell um their their wares and to engage in um, their trade. Um, there's also the secondary meaning of the word chartered, which refers to mapped. Okay, so there's right. this idea. Yeah. I think um, there's a correlation between the mapping, selling, and control of space with the control and selling of people. He talks about the youthful harlot or youthful prostitute being the strongest um, example. Yeah, Um, good point. There is also uh, this notion of um, disease that goes all the way through the poem. Um, So... In the first stanza, and he picks up on this in the last stanza or paragraph of poetry. Mm, um, yeah. And mark in every, I notice, I mark in every fa- face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So on the one hand, he's saying, well, um, uh, I notice that everybody looks sad. That their 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 faces show me that they are sad and weak and ill. On the other hand, I think there's this notion of this biblical notion, and of course William Blake was very influenced by biblical language, of being marked by the beast. Um, and so this notion mm. that everybody is marked physically deformed, he implies by sexually transmitted disease, it's syphilis oh, right. in the period, right. yeah. and that he notices that everybody has syphilitic symptoms. Um, and these represent the mark of the beast um, or the mark of Cain in the Bible, which is this idea that um, physical deformity um kind of represents uh, moral deformity or moral problems. Um, yeah, so I think that this Can, is very... Sorry. Yeah, I'd like to point out, um, so um, in this first stanza here, um, and regarding this, this, this word mark, um, he says, he does something here. He, he, so first he puns off of mark. Um, a pun is when... Um, you you repeat a word that um, sounds the same, but it has a, a different meaning. Uh, and so um, he first marks, which, as you said, means to observe in every face, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So to mark is to observe. Marks are the, the scars, like, as you said, it could be syphilitic marks. But there's a wonderful sort of twisting bitter irony there. Um, so as he's observing um, what kind of mark, I, I, I mark in every face I meet, I observe in every face I meet, um, but what do I observe? I observe marks. Um, I observe um, these, these, these scars, scars of weakness, the, the, the kind of marks. And um, that use of repetition uh, with a kind of bitter, twisting irony, he keeps ratcheting up the the, the sense of, of bitter irony again and again. 
So the second stanza, um, uh, Blake uses anaphora, a form of repetition where you use the same expression at the beginning of a successive um, number of clauses or sentences. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. Now, ban means a publicly proclaimed legal decision, such as your wedding bans. When you Mm. get married, you have to... So he introduces the theme of marriage here. When you get married, I think two weeks before your wedding, you have to um, publicly declare that you're going to get married, and these are called the wedding bans. Um, But, of course, ban also has that... um, meaning with which we're more familiar these days, uh, meaning a ban, you're not allowed to do something, you're banned from doing something. And clearly, um, Blake associates, I mean, bans and charters are quite similar in a sense, and clearly Blake associates um, this notion of marriage with a notion of unfreedom, of being banned from doing what you would... um, really want to do. Uh, Elsewhere, Blake famously says, and rather shockingly says, um, better kill an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. In other words, it is better to, um, to, to not live than it is to live a life in which you cannot fulfill your own personal wants and needs. Um, so Blake evokes then, um, a scene of universal misery, which is yeah. emphasized by the rep- um, repetition of in every, in every risk refers to everyone. Mm. Okay, we are yeah. all culpable in this situation. And he closes um, the, uh, the poem with this beautiful, uh, the, sorry, the stanza with this image, the mind forged manacles I hear. Now, this I think is also an oxymoron in a way mm. because. Yeah. Um, uh, the making of manacles, that is handcuffs, some, you know, so making something out of metal, that is a very, very physical process. You think of hitting the hammer against the hot metal, forging right, right. the metal. But he suggests that this is made in the mind. Yeah. And by mind forged, well, what do you think he means by ma- mind forged manacles? These Um, fictional handcuffs that we keep ourselves locked into certain things with well i mean i i think that um you know there i think there's there's a couple answers to this one is that it's an allusion to to rousseau um who um wrote you know that we are born free but we live everywhere in chains um, in in the social contract um, he, you know, he basically said that that um, that we're only obliged to obey legitimate power. That um, force does not create right, um, and and so the the and and you know he he was very famous for this idea that um, you know civilization corrupts us. Um, that 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 we, you know we, we are originally innocent as opposed to originally sinful, and and so I think the idea that an unjust civilization is created in our minds first through be- the belief of all of these people who are sleepwalking through their lives um, is 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 very much um, is is very much present here. I think this is an, an allusion to Rousseau. It's also, of course, um, Blake's own idea, um, which is that, that that he would develop later on that, um, that, you know, we are freed through our imaginations. And, and so, um, I think that there is an element of, of Rousseau and the social contract here, the social contract which is being broken by those in power. Um, the charter, uh, you know, comes from the sovereign. And, uh, and so, um, 
if the sovereign is is partially responsible for for what's going on, then um, and, and the people are um, the people don't you know are are not forced to believe um, in an illegitimate um, power. It's all in their minds, and they can throw off the shackles um, simply through belief. Um, so, um, you know, by changing their beliefs, changing their 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 ideas. Yeah, that, sorry, that was uh, 1762 is when uh, Rousseau wrote The Social Contract. And uh, Rousseau was 1712 to 1778, 1762 wrote The Social yeah, Contract. Yeah, yeah. No, I... It is. It's very important, isn't it? I, I would just like to add, I mean, on a, on a more mundane level. Sure. Uh, this notion of the mind forge manacles. I mean, that you're, of course, right to interpret it in the light of Rousseau. But I think sure. we can just interpret in a very kind of everyday uh, way, which is basically that largely the things that make us unfree are things that we choose, are things, that, in other words, that we we kind of agree to um, because we think there's no alternative. Um, so it's our own minds that make us unfree, in a sense, um, by, for example, uh, believing that we have to fit in with certain ideas or values when we don't. Um, they, these, the, this manacles us to our society, to the world um, that we live in. Um, so should we move on to the next stanza? Yeah, um, yeah sure. And, and uh, uh, how the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. That's great. Yes. Wow. So uh, it is great. Yeah, you're right. absolutely. It's yeah. it's. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, in a sense, you can see that Blake is dismantling the whole state, isn't he? He's he's yeah. he's moved from um, trade and commerce to the power of the sovereign, um, to the nature of sex and marriage, mm -hmm. and now he's talking about how the how the chimney sweepers cry. These were little boys that were forced up chimneys during the period to clean them right. out. Um, and so he's referring to child labor in the early industrial period. Um, every blackening church appalls. Now, he seems to link, very interestingly, the soot, the dirt that would be on these small children's bodies from going up and down chimneys, to the church, implying perhaps that the church, which should be the source of, you know, obviously of um, spiritual help and so forth, is complicit in a system that forces tiny children to go up uh, chimneys. Yeah, that, that's, I think, very, very important, um, yeah. that Blake yeah. views the church as an organisation, as, as being kind of guilty um, by acquiescing to these powers. Um, and he continues, and the hapless oh. soldier's sigh okay, runs sorry, in blood. I... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's gonna, uh, I mean, that, that there's an ambiguity in that phrase, church appalls. Is it um, the church that is appalled, or is the church that is doing the appalling uh, that, that is appalling? Um, every blackening church appalls. Church appalls. Um, also, um, the the word appalls is um, is into the blackening church appall. This, this there it, we, the the oxymoron comes back. Uh, there's a the French. Um, root of appalls is to make pale um and there's a pun there as well um appall is um something that you throw over um isn't don't you throw it over a coffin appall is it's a it's a um, yes as in pole yeah. bearers the guys yeah. who carry coffins yeah. yes yeah. yeah yeah um and and so um there, there's some foreshadowing here of, of the marriage hearse. Um, mm -hmm. Every blackening church appalls. Uh, so the, the blackening church appalls, but it, it, it appears to be appalled, but actually it's, um, um, it's, 
it's pretending, you know, it is, um, it's not really, um, you know, it's not really registering the disgrace. It's still, um, it's still white. Mm. And, but I think also the, the power of a lot of Blake's poetry lies in the way that he takes um, a metaphor. The church is blackening and it makes people who look at it uh, pale in fear yeah um so they don't enjoy going to church but so this is a sort of metaphorical reading of the line but mm, there's also this line, idea yeah. okay that the church is blackening in a literal sense in early mm. industrialization the right. buildings were getting yeah. darker and darker when when my yes. father who grew up in london in the 1950s he would always point out that all of the buildings were black in the 50s and 60s, not because people painted them, but because they were covered in coal dust. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so there's this really kind of concrete image of what industrialization and, you know, lots of people living together in a small space does. And this is related then to a much more kind of metaphorical and even metaphysical um, level about mm. the nature of the church as an institution. The black Blake famously, church. exactly, Blake famous. There's also this notion perhaps that the church, if we relate this back to the Marx, that the church blackens its congregation. That mm. is that the church marks its congregation. Right. It pollutes its congregation, the people that go to the church. It, um, it, it might be worth mentioning here that... Um, that Blake was against the Anglican Church. Um, he was not um, a supporter of the Anglican Church. He he, um, and um, you know he had his own kind of um, um, form of Christianity that he developed uh, that that uh, we don't have time to discuss here. But but um, yes, he's certainly a nonconformist. Yeah, I think we definitely. can we can leave definitely. it at that. Yeah, he did not like the institute institutional church he was quite devout in his own way but he did not like the institution of the anglican church um, mm. yeah he, i mean and this is this is because sorry to interrupt this is, this is because he viewed quite correctly um the anglican church as being complicit with uh the powers of the state and with capitalism right and of right. course blake understood christianity you know whatever you think about Christianity, um, this is not the original notion of Christianity, right, which is a religion um, founded by very, very poor people, by carpenters and fishermen. Um, so there's this kind of notion that the church has become corrupted through greed, um, which, of course, is a kind of theme of a lot of religious poetry and literature, um, pretty much all of it, in fact. Right. Um and then the stanza, I mean, an interesting way is, of course, it's kind of because of the rhyme scheme, um, the stanzas are quite self-contained and the two concepts are more closely related. So the chimney sweeper's cry is um, a vocal sound that's related to mm. the hapless soldier's sigh. So he Good rhymes yeah. uh, sigh and cry together. Um, to, again, suggest a similar notion that the, the soldier is unhappy, as is the child, just as he rhymes appalls and walls together, suggesting perhaps that the church, rather than knocking down walls, builds up walls, yes, that the church is a kind of barrier to spirituality rather than a... Um, uh, rather than a kind of um, thing that might help us understand the spiritual aspect of life. And he says, and that, this is an interesting image, I'm not sure what to make of it, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. Yes, yeah. It makes me think of the French Revolution, but, mm. um, you know, maybe, you know, an impending, you know, a sense of impending revolution. And, of course, um you know, the, it would have been 14 years earlier. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, that Blake could have been involved in the Gordon riots, which took place. They were anti-Catholic riots, but it had a revolutionary uh, fervor to it. Um, like the, you know, the, the, the storming of the Bastille, they, they, they set Newgate prison on fire and, um, and released 
um, and release the inmates um, from 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 Newgate Prison, and and so this idea of um, you know storming, you know, it would in that case it was the prison storming the institutions of power, um, and and blood running down the walls. I mean, that literally happened. Um, not not the palace, but certainly the, you know the institutions were were um, uh, so that that revolutionary energy um, is, is certainly uh, you can certainly get that in in that imagery there of the blood running down the palace walls. Mm. Yes, I mean we're, we're, it's ambiguous as to whose blood it is. I think that that's quite yeah, yeah, important. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, I, I just suggest let's we will of course leave links to information about the Gordon riots and about the French Revolution um, below the podcast in the description, um, so that people at their own will can check this stuff out. But now, because we're running out of time, let's let's mm -hmm. move on to that final remarkable stanza. Yeah. But through midnight streets, I hear how the youthful harlot's curse um, blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So one of the interesting things here is that um, Shakespeare... Oh, sorry, Freudian slip. Blake um, <laughs> uses, uh, just as he does with Mark. So in the first, in the first stanza, he uses the word Mark um, as a, a verb and then as a noun. And um, here, the youthful harlot's curse. Now, the primary meaning of the word curse in this instance, I think, is swearing that they're swearing sure. at the, uh, the newborn infant's tear. However, yeah. of course, curse also as a noun refers to this kind of spell cast by a witch. Mm -hmm. um, and the, this, this idea of the spell that the harlot or prostitute gives is uh, syphilis, sexually transmitted disease um, that um, was not only transmitted among parents, so from husband to wife, usually it has to be said, but also um, it is inherited from your parents. So in right. a sense, there's this, this universal infection in the period was syphilis because basically everybody had it and it is untreatable in the period and very, very unpleasant. But there's this idea that even before you're born, you're marked, with the sins of your parents, you're marked with um, the mark of the beast. Yes, yeah, I mean, um, and I think that um, there's a meaning that may have been active at the time as well. Um, Venus's curse was a, um, a, a, a slang term for venereal disease. Venus and, being the goddess of love. The goddess of love, right, <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So, I mean, they're, they're, you know, literally the harlot's curse blasts the newborn infant's tear. Um, I also, the thing that I, I, I see in this, in this last stanza, it seems to me that the last stanza is almost a kind of, it takes you deeper and it reframes everything that has been said before. And so if you think, you know, the dominant, you know, you know sound is crying. You know, London mm. is crying in this poem, and and mm. and the very the first the, you think of the Thames, you know, it, it might be the the sort of the the gush of, of tears, right? And so, if London is crying, London is the infant, you know, and and what does the infant have to to comfort it? The youthful harlot, you know, uh, London is an infant with a parent who is a harlot, uh, who's a prostitute, um, who has um, you know, um, you know, who, who has derelict in, 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 um, in her duty. If you, if you, if you're looking at it from this point of view, um, and, and so, um, and blights with plagues, the marriage hearse. So, um, it, it's this idea that, that, um, the that that the, that the city that the those who are entrusted to care for the city to the care for the people in the city have completely neglected 
neglected their duty. And for, you know, there was instead, so um, the in, we have the infant's tear and instead of comfort, there is a curse. Mm, mm. And yes, I, and yeah, sorry, sorry if I could just add, um, this word blights is very important here. Mm. So again, there's this sort of verb noun thing that Blake does, I think, uh, very effectively in this poem. Um, and blight is, uh, as a noun, it refers to um, a type of kind of disease I suppose, that immature crops get, as in potato blight or um, blight on the cornfield. So there's this notion, and I think this refers, so it's, it's for crops which are not fully grown yet, and there's this idea that the child, the infant, has got this blight, this mm. um, infection, uh, yeah. because it's inherited syphilis from its mother and father, and also because it... Um, because it's being cursed, you know, because its mother is shouting at it. So there's yes. no tenderness in this poem anywhere. I think that that's something that's very, very important, um, that right. this and is a it's, world it's, wholly without tenderness. Right, and so, and it's a, to, to go back to the Rousseau, it's a complete um, betrayal of the social contract, you know, um, and it's, it's this sort of prostitution of the state of 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 the commonwealth uh, right at the center of um the um the city there yeah absolutely um a youthful harlot might also be a an oxymoron as you know um how can a child be a prostitute you know um um uh, but um i'm not i'm not sure yeah, well, certainly it's a, um, it's a jarring and disturbing image. Um, one of the things that's worth, this is a really dark note to end the podcast on. Yeah. But, um, uh, one of the things that's worth considering is that in this period in London, right through actually to the end of the 19th century, um, child prostitution and uh, paedophilia were absolutely widespread and completely ignored by the authorities. Um, right. So again, there's this sense of complete corruption, um, both in the sense of political corruption, but also in the Shakespearean sense of corruption being corruption in Shakespearean language is a kind of um, blight. Right. It's a kind of rotting from the inside out. Yeah. And this is what I think um, Blake is suggesting is happening in, in the society of universal suffering um that we are all corrupted and that all of the institutions of civilization only further corrupt us that's an excellent one yeah excellent point i couldn't have yeah i mean um i think that all the just to to conclude um I think that there there is one final um, thing to note here that certainly was going through my mind as I read it. I think that there, you know, this image of the marriage hearse, the blights, the bla blasting, the corruption, the rottenness. I think there's an under under there there are echoes here of Hamlet. Um, you know, you have. Um, the um you know dirge and marriage you know that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um the funeral baked meats that did coldly furnish forth the marriage table and of course in denmark is is a state that is rotten and it's rotten because um because claudius um ha the, the the king has murdered his brother and married um his brother's wife um you know, in this, mm. in and I, I think that there are echoes there, and for people that want to, you know, chase those down, I think the words blight, blast, um, uh, yes, marriage hearse yeah. are, are fruitful places. Precisely, to yeah, and um, of course, was that an was that an 
intentional plug of, of our services. So if you are, if you <laughs> are interested in, bit, in yeah. yeah, let's yeah, smoothly yeah. segue into the yeah. um, advertising. If you are interested in our courses, one of which is on Hamlet, then go and check out gilcrestandhamilton.com where you can find one-stop solutions to the problem of learning GCSE English literature. Also, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to us and um, check us out on Facebook. Thank you very much, and we'll be back in a week or so to discuss another poem from the syllabus. If you have any suggestions about any poems or themes that you'd like us to talk about, then please get in touch. Thank you very much, and goodbye.